I, I want to take a liberty and um, kind of introduce this into a, uh, almost as though I am going into the grain of sand that William Blake held in his hand. You know, the idea of getting into another world. <clears throat> I think that it's, it's kind of what artists do in a way. I mean, um, uh, Michael had mentioned the idea of being able to smell the clay, the caliche. You know, well, how does an artist paint caliche and have you then um, be able to function within the premise that you're there, that you are in it and of it and about it? Um, I, I have a tendency to go into a state. Uh, you could call it another state, a state of being. Um, I use imagery like a bridge. You're crossing a bridge going from here to there, from here to somewhere. Go ahead and click, uh, if you would. Let's just start these things. I'm going to let them kind of roll in a, in a, in a, in a way. Um, I, I like the idea of doing that. And I'm going to give you two examples. One is I, I get up in the morning before daylight. I go outside, cold or not, and I stand out in the front part of our, by our house and I look at the stars and, and, you know, see this, that, and the other in the night sky. And you can, you can really tell the time of day by looking up and looking at the sky. One morning I went out and it was, <clears throat> it was extremely cold. It was down into the single digits. Uh, the, over the past week, the snow had thawed and froze and thawed and froze several times. And it sounded as though there, were, there was a, like a rain tree out in the pinions a rain tree being one of those pipe things that you turn and components fall down through it and makes a raining, tingling noise and you turn it over and it falls the other way and it's considered like a child's toy in a way. But it's sort of a brilliant uh, little apparatus. Well, I heard noise like that just completely engulfing the pinions. And it was a herd of elk that was walking through the darkness. They weren't running, they weren't stampeding, they were m making their way up the mountainside, um, which is very rocky. So it's a, a, a certain terrain with a, you know, a cast of several hundred elk that are walking up this mountain. And the noise that came from it uh, was so inspiring that it, it uh, I looked at it as though I was being spoken to by some natural event. So nature is speaking to me. I considered that there are those that has, I'll say walked among us, that recorded that. Uh, there are, were certain Chief Joseph, uh, Chief Seattle, uh, certain uh, tribal leaders, uh, shamanistic people who heard and relayed what they heard to, uh, to the world. So I considered that I was being spoken to by that strata of existence. It's totally ephemeral. There's no physical manifestation of it there before me. It's just me and mind. I am, I am, in essence, dreaming a dream that happens to have a certain reality to it. Well, that's where my art comes from. I make art about that. This piece that's up here, and, I, I, and I'm starting off, I'm going to show three or four, quote, earlier pieces. This is from uh, early 70s. It came from being in the uh, Kit Carson National Forest. Uh, right out of Taos, New Mexico, and I was with a forest ranger who told me this story of a bear that had been caught in a fire and had been blinded 
by the fire and singed. And he was running, the bear was running down the mountainside and just the, it's like a runaway truck. You know, there's, there's an off ramp. There's a safety ramp that the truck can take. But for a bear under those circumstances, there was no safety ramp. There was, there was nothing to impede that. He couldn't see. He was panicked. He was wounded. And where this forest ranger was telling the story was there was a tree, that tree that's in that bear's hand in this sculpture, um, a little tree. Now this land had just been clear cut. So it, the National Forest is for sale, in case anybody didn't really know that. Uh, they sold off big blocks of land to forest companies. Um, but that little tree was out in the left, in the, in the rubble, the rubble pile. So I took it and I went to make a bear. Uh, so this is called Blind Bear Holding a Crooked Stick. Um, what is the significance of that in a way? Um, it's kind of the paradox of our existence. We all live within a certain, go ahead and click. Um, we all live in a certain paradox. Um, something is, it's there, it's known, we have it, we've got it in our grasp, and then we lose it. It's gone. I, I heard this kind of a given as a factual reality. Uh, a comparison of people that live to be a hundred years old or older. So uh, hang on back there, my friend. <laughs> you, you'll soon be there. Um, the thing they had uh, in common was not really their diet, not their money. They came from different stratas of life, but they all had lost. They'd lost so many things. They'd lost land, they'd lost businesses, they'd lost spouses, they'd lost children, they'd lost houses. You know, uh, I'd, I'd give you Dick Ray as an example, who lost his house, his art, and his son, all within months of each other. Um, and what do you do? How do you continue? How do you, how do you go on? Um, it's something we all have to really do and think about. This piece that's up there now is, um, it's up on a balcony in the De Palm Desert Museum in um, wherever Palm Desert, California is, out in the desert somewhere. Uh, <clears throat> but it was made uh, there in Kit Carson National Forest. I, I cast a three foot square slab and said, this is the center of my studio. So my studio could have been 100 feet wide, it could have been 100 miles wide. It could, my studio was as big as I wanted it to be, but that was the middle of it, was right there. And it had no roof, had no walls, had no boundaries. And I made this from a log that I bought from the National Forest, from the forest ranger that told me the story about the bear. He said, well, I to asked him if there was a tree that I could get in the forest. He said, yeah, I'll show it to you. He showed me this huge ponderosa tree and said that they were gonna cut it down. And I said, well, why would you cut it down? He said, because it's a rogue tree. And I, I pictured this tree running through backyards, tearing up, <laughs> tearing, tearing up clotheslines and uh, you know, rampaging the village. And uh, so I said, well, w why is the tree rogue? And he said, because lightning could strike it and cause a fire. It was part of the tree at the top was dead. Um, so they were going to take the tree out to quote, save a forest fire. I bought this tree for $2. I paid a $2 tag fee and took the log and made the sculpture on the side of a mountain in New Mexico. 
uh, in Kit Carson National Forest. I made uh, seven pieces in about three months and all seven of the pieces are in museums. I mean, it's really amazing when, the, when Seattle speaks, when nature speaks, when you get a calling, when you hear the voice, you know, when you answer and you give in to it and you completely go with it. Like, how can I get into the grain of sand in William Blake's hand? That's completely possible. And I operate under the premise, go ahead, flip the switch. I operate under a premise that that is possible. This piece was made on the same three foot square slab on the side of a mountain. It's not in a museum because we bought it back from a collector. This is called She Brings Gifts to Me. Um, I had fallen in love with the most perfect woman on the planet um, during that period. And she's sitting here in the second row uh, right now. And she is the one that's bringing the gift. The gift to me was a freedom, a psychological freedom that uh, I was afforded you know, to be unencumbered, to go out as far as I want to go <clears throat> and then dream a dream and bring it back and then set about manifesting that dream. Go ahead. <clears throat> this is uh, Charmaine and I up close to Niagara Falls. Uh, this whole entire sculpture was hand chopped with a hatchet out in the middle of a field. You know, um, I probably, I probably was Superman at that time of my life. I was so imbued with power, psychological power and belief in myself that there was really nothing I felt like I couldn't do. And it's, it's pretty amazing living in that kind of uh, a, a headspace. Um, I, think, I think artists have to be willing to delve into that. Now, the reward system, on the other hand, for those efforts and those endeavors is something that you cannot necessarily count on, nor should you necessarily expect to count on. Um, I'll give you an example of that. Go ahead and flip a switch. Um, man, this is called Tornado. This was written about in Time Magazine. Um, Hughes, Robert Hughes, a, 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 a critic, an old heavy duty macho critic for Time Magazine wrote about this as the uh, tornado coming down and chewing up the church. And I said, fine, that's great. Thank you very much for putting a picture of it in Time Magazine. And I'm glad you liked it, but the tornado is not tearing up the church. There's nothing about that church that's tore up. That power is not going down into the church and chewing it. It is emanating the power that's coming out. So. You know, I think you have to look at art very carefully and really del deal and delve into it very carefully. You have to ask it very specific questions. Um, go ahead. This is called Timber's Cross and Hearts of Men Sway Aloft in Whispering Wind. It's about being in the woods, in the forest, where you are actually speaking to and conversing with and having conversations with the elements that are there. Um, this particular stump, our children dug out of our garden with spoons. They, they dug the, the stump out of the garden with spoons and they loved it. It's like little kids playing in the sandbox or playing at the sand pile or playing in the meander of the creek. Um, the axe, the spirit, the stump. Charmaine brought home a stack of kind of thesis-esque papers once about uh, the history of the stump in American art. 
the stump played a huge role in American art. I mean, I mean the white part of our world hit the, hit the East Coast running. We were chopping down trees as fast as we could go and moving west with it. Uh, the stump was a huge, huge part. In early American art, there's many, 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 many paintings with stumps in the field. Go ahead. This is Charmaine and I in our front yard in Splendora. That's our front yard. Uh, that front yard is 200 acres, and we still own it. We still have it. Um, we still go there. Um, after we moved, this is part of the paradox of uh, existence, I guess. Um, without delving deep into the personal realities, I will tell you that uh, uh, Charmaine loaded up our stuff and moved out to Colorado. She was gracious enough and loving enough to give me access to the trip. She told me I could go with her if I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a huge deal. That's not a lightweight offer. That's a big deal offer, you know. I couldn't go immediately. Um, I, I, I was teaching at Sam Houston State, teach, well it wasn't teachers college, it was university. So I was teaching at Sam Houston University at the time for a couple of years and I had some months left in the reality of that endeavor. <clears throat> I had a show that was opening over in Tyler, Texas at the, uh, oh man, the Cowan Center at their theater there and it was called Swimming in Forever. And I put a huge sculpture in their lobby that's still there, by the way. The sculpture is called Swimming in Forever. Well, how do you swim in forever? In the first place, how do you even define what constitutes forever? Forever is one of those terms like always. Oh, always? I mean, always into perpetuity? Is always, always for always? Um, those are kind of esoteric questions that artists deal with because they have the mental need to deal with them, to tell you the truth. Um, ironically, Charmaine was in Colorado. I was over in Tyler, Texas, standing at my opening uh, under Swimming in Forever. And uh, I wrote a little essay for a catalog that was, that was a very, very positive essay about where I was in my life. But I ended it, the last paragraph said, but don't, don't always believe what you see. You know, sometimes things can be really, really different. Uh, people's personal life gets very complicated, you know, and how do you relate that complicatedness into a work of art where that message is transferred to someone else? I don't make art to hang on the wall and look good. Uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not, you know, I'm not of the Charlie Tuna school of, uh, you know, it's got to just taste good. It, I mean, it's, it's, it, it really has to say something. It has to mean something. You have to ask art, flip a switch. You have to ask it what it is. What does it do? What's it say? What's it for? This, this piece of art is called Working in the Garden. It is a whirlwind of elevation. Um, I can sometimes get engulfed psychologically to the point that I quite literally can go Ooh, and just rise off the planet, you know, and that's, that's great, assuming you can come back, you know, and there are those that really have a hard time getting back. Um, I have friends that have a hard time coming back, you know, if you, if you're supposed to take the trash out three days a week and you only do it one day a week, you didn't come back two days, <laughs> you know, um, it, it, I'm just saying it's hard to make that balance, but it's, it's unbelievably positive 
in, I'll say, an artist's life, whether it's my life or David's or, you know, Roger's, anybody, any artist around, any creative person, you know, there has to be a certain support team that's around you that gives you the ability to fly. And <clears throat> I've been afforded that. I've been given that ability. You know, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful gift. She brings gifts to me. That's what the gift is, you know, is, uh, is that very thing. Go ahead. This is um, Charmaine and I in New Orleans. We're at the New Orleans Museum. And this piece is about elevation. It's about that flight of leaving the earth, of just rising. Um, I, I pride myself on the ability to do that. Um, and sometimes people think maybe I'm aloof or I'm not listening or I'm not paying attention. And that's because sometimes I'm aloof and <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean to do it like that, but there's a reality to that. Go ahead. Oh man, this is called balance. Uh, this is right out of the East Texas woods. God, I love the East Texas woods. You know, I mean, this organization for all practical purposes really is about the borderlands. It really is about the West. It really is about the Southwest. It really is about, I would say, Interstate 45 West. I was Interstate 45 East. You know, I grew up in what was called the Big Thicket. I grew up in, uh, you know, where there was blackjacks and sweet gums and magnolias and pine trees and and oaks of every imaginable sort. Um, that's the, the whisper that I heard. That's the noise that I heard. Um, go ahead. This is kind of like swimming in forever. This one was called Walking in Immensity. This was out, uh, I made it for Carol and Bill McKay out at, in Granbury. <clears throat> at their branch. It has since decayed and crumbled and fell. I made a whole strata of art in the late 70s through the early, through the 80s that that happened to, I mean, like literally 20 plus pieces of art, major, major, major sculptures that entropy swallowed, en entropy just ate it and devoured it and the wood, the steel was left but the wood, even though I had treated this, and I can tell you, I can have an association for what Roger's daddy did working down at the creosote plant. There was a creosote plant in Conroe, Texas, and I would go over and get the butt end off of telephone poles and, and pier uh, that were, had been treated uh, and chop them into these forms and make this make sculptures out of them. Go ahead. Oh man. Charmaine and I used to walk uh, down a road with tall trees on each side of a narrow road. So the only way you could traverse the road at night under pitch black circumstances was you would look up and you could see a slight difference in coloration of the sky. So if you looked up and followed the path by looking up and getting your markings, you could then walk through the darkness with it, which is a pretty unique thing. We would go over to a hay meadow, which we now own, we bought the hay meadow, but we would go over to a hay meadow and stand there and look at the night sky I wrote a poem called Love Light Comes Down Rays at Night, but nobody sees because the light's too bright. The too bright light was like if you look south from our place back toward Houston, there was just a big, big fuzzy glow 
over Houston <coughs> with no stars. If you look north from that hay meadow, you could see a pretty distinct night sky. Where we live now, you can see a night sky that goes on to infinity. Uh, it's, it's staggering, the clarity uh, of it. But this is called night vision. There were five daughters at the time. There's five petals on a flower that the character is holding. Uh, the character has his hand out, open, an open hand, and, and, with, and a big flower coming out of his ear and a big flower coming out of his head. The whole entire sculpture is bulbous, uh, it's, it's volumetric, um, it's coming out of a female house. Uh, you can't tell from the slide, but it is a female house and there is a very much a crevice, a concave crevice in the, in the front of that house, like it would be the door of the house that was made from chopping that, was my, that house was my chopping block for like three or four years. Over a three or four year period, you can chop, 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 chop. And you will literally just take a soft curve inward uh, on the block from where the piece of wood fits. <clears throat> this was at the um, one of several pieces that I've shown in the Whitney Museum. And this one was in the Whitney in a writer for the, you ready for this? The Soho News. Uh, the Soho News critic uh, loved the piece, okay? But he said it was beautifully horrific, as though from a drug-induced nightmare. And I looked at it and I thought, well, if I live down in Soho, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he knows what a drug-induced nightmare is. <laughs> My nights, on the other hand, were great. I'm standing in a hay meadow. I'm looking at the night sky. I'm hugging the woman that I love the most in the whole entire world. Uh, what could be better, you know? So I had a positive experience with the night vision, and he didn't. And that's really the flaw in there uh, is how, how it is looked at. What's the view that it is, that it is taken to give you either credence, either life or death? Um, go ahead. This was on the front of the Visions catalog at the Dallas Museum. Um, it's called Visions. Go ahead. This is owned by the Whitney. It's called uh, Me and the Butcher Knives. Whoa. Go ahead. This is owned by the uh, Smithsonian. Um, it's, um, it's a man with a wand, a stick. Man, kid, little kids love sticks. They'll, I mean, a two-year-old will pick up a stick and point it at you. You know, I mean, they love sticks. I grew up holding sticks and playing with sticks and riding sticks like horses and building forts uh, with them and chopping them. And the, so I, I think it's Merlin. Merlin has the wand and I have the hatchet. I felt like, and still do, I can make anything. I can go to the hardware store, get a $29 hatchet, go to the feed store, get a rasp that's made for shoeing horses. It's made for filing horses' hooves. And I can buy a chisel. So for $60, I can have every tool I need to, to make some really incredible, great art. Um, and so I look at it like there's no excuse. I cannot accept an excuse. I mean, I've heard sculptors particularly say, oh, I can't make art today, I don't have a welding machine, I don't have a grinder, I don't have a big chunk of steel, I don't have a hoist, I don't have a truck, I don't, they can list off a menagerie of what they don't have. <clears throat> All I need is an idea. And I got more ideas than I can do in, in 10 years. 
So I'm 10 years behind on my 10 year plan. Um, go ahead. Charmaine Locke. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Go ahead. <laughs> this is looking out of our kitchen window. Go ahead. This was in the Meadows Museum. It's 20 feet, foot, foot long. It's a big table with a cream pitcher. I do a lot of vessels, bowls, pitchers. They're all female oriented. Go ahead. Bridge. I like doorways, thresholds, divides. Johnny Cash has a line in his, in his song saying, where he sings about uh, crossing the universe divide. I mean, the universe divide, what is that? What is a, what is a divided universe? And if you're on one side of the divide, how do you get to the other? That's what we aspire to do, is cross the Rubicon, cross the river, you know, go through the window, go open the door. Um, I use needles, diamonds, jewels, those things, parts of the thread at the top of the needle that's on this bridge. Um, those things are clean, calculated, rational, systematic, very concise, very precise, very mathematical in, in that sense, you know. And humans have had that, developed that part of their brain since we've been developing our brains forever. You know, that's part of what we do is think things out, think things through. At least we think we think them out. That's our goal. Um, go ahead. This is, um, this covers three stories in a office building right behind the uh, New York Public Library. It's on 40 between 41st and 42nd or something on six, like 6th Avenue. Um, I had the opportunity to make something that went right down through a slit for three floors. And I made this in a room that it would not fit in. And I, I took up the stuff out of the room, the studio, I gridded off the floor to simulate the space in the building. I made one side, we flipped it over, made the parallel side, uh, and then had it where it come apart. We then stood it up and made the flowers to where it went on it. Um, I, again, I just look at it like, you know, if, if, if I could not make something because I did not have a space to make it, well, I'd never really get to make anything, you know? If you, if you say, oh, I don't have a, my place is too little. Well, then go out in the yard, you know? Just <laughs> make it in the yard. Um, Charmaine and I lived in a one-room house for like five years. I mean, one room. That was it. The kitchen, the bathroom, the bedroom, the living room, the dining room, everything was in one room. And we both made art. We made, we, we had dinner parties for like a hundred people, you know, and we just do it in the yard. Uh, it's really amazing. Henry Luce, bless his heart, ferried people from the front of our property up to our house, up our driveway, because the bus driver wouldn't go across our bridge. And he had a big old limousine. And so he was there with the board of the new museum uh, and from New York. I mean, here's, here's the board of the new museum having lunch in our front yard. Um, I just operate under the premise that all things are possible and all things are doable. You just have to say, yes, 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 yeah, absolutely, we can do that. And no one, it's not easy, go ahead. <clears throat> uh, 
I draw. I don't erase. I don't smudge. I don't smear. I don't go back and fix anything. I stick the pencil onto the paper and I push as hard as I can. It's a Kathy Brimberry can tell you that's a flaw with me in trying to use a greasy pencil on a plate. I, I smush the pencil because I'm pushing on it. Uh, this is uh, this is about complete fragments. The whole concept for a complete fragment, really I got solidly indoctrinated into that uh, through the uh, Romantic poets. Coleridge was notorious for writing something and working on it and then finally getting so tired and sleepy he couldn't work on it anymore and then going to bed and then getting up the next day and not being able to remember where he left off. It was like he had to start over on it in, in its entirety. And it's the reason that why so many of Coleridge's work, there's a, a, a roll, an unfinished rolling at the end you know, it's like, oh, oh woo, 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 what's next? You know, I mean, it's just, it's just like it got chopped off or something. And the critics of the day uh, call that complete fragments, thinking, okay, this fragment of the whole has to be a whole in and of itself. And so that's what this is about. Um, it's very complicated, you know. Um, I will show you in a, few, in, a, in a minute or two that I draw with my left hand and I draw with my right hand, and sometimes I draw with my right hand and my left hand simultaneously. Um, sometimes I draw with my eyes closed. I know how big my board is, I know how big my paper is, I know where my hand will fit in relation to the, this side and to this other side over here, and I know where my pencil is. And I know what a pencil lead does when you pull it across, it starts to flat. And if you want a fine trace, a fine line that disappears, you have to turn the pencil lead to its edge and then you can just let it bleed out. And it'll go out to just a very fine spider web-esque line and disappear. So you can make from a deep, dark, heavy line to a minute, fine line in one stroke, but you have to know the material uh, to do that. Go, go ahead. This was a commission for an office in La Jolla, and she said, the person that called me up to commission it said, and I want something big with flowers and eyes in it. I said, I'm your guy. <laughs> <laughs> you call the right person. I love doing it, you know, I just love making it. I, I, I never feel like a commission is an infringement. If they say something like, I need something four foot high and eight foot wide, I say, oh man, I know how to do that, <laughs> you know. If they wanted something four foot high and eight foot wide and blue, on the other hand, I'd send them on down the road. Um, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> this is a blue one. <laughs> <laughs> Where did this go? I think this went to... Uh, Charmaine, what's the name of the, of, the, of the president of the University of Oklahoma? David Bourne. David Bourne bought this for, to go in front of a new cancer research hospital in Oklahoma City. And he picked me up at the airport in Oklahoma City. We drove to a restaurant to have a hamburger. And uh, he said, well, here's what I want. How much will it cost? And I gave him some outlandish amount of money and he said, that's great. And we shook hands and that was the end of it. <laughs> if you're working with a city, you'd spend two years in hell <laughs> trying to do something like that. 
But if, if you can make it to the top of the elevator, you know, and, and, and shake hands with somebody, uh, then you go down the elevator with a check in your pocket and, and, and you get to go home and make it. I mean, I love doing, <clears throat> I love doing business like that. Working with institutions, I, I have to tell you, it's, uh, my God in heaven, I'll get a contract that's 23 pages long that uh, that young lady, the lawyer up here, couldn't read, you know? Uh, what am I doing, you know? Uh, all right, go ahead. This, uh, this is called All I Ever Wanted Was to Go Home With You. That's, that's a fact. Uh, this was a poem that I wrote that's actually a full-length poem, uh, but it became the title for this, this drawing. This is like a, a uh, this drawing is actually 352 million light years across. You know, I mean, size, I mean size, size is a, it's a pictorial reference. How big is your love? I mean, how, how, how big can that be? Well, that can be as big as you can project. You know, you know it's only this big. Well, you know, that's not going to last long. <laughs> you know, uh, all I ever wanted was to go home with her. That was it. And when I got to go home with her, I found my bearings. I found my track. I found my... My, um, I found the pace. I became my own pace horse in that sense. From that point on, it was like me keeping up with me. And I, I'll tell you something personal about a, a Go ahead, flip a switch. I'll tell you something personal about dreaming. The dreams that you dream, I mean, the, the Ted, I think, is the collector gentleman that was here. I mean, basically, they're talking about a dream. What do you do with a dream when you amass a dream, when you put the dream together, when your dream comes true? Then what do you do with it? You know, how do you, how do you handle it? I, I've dreamed a lot of things that have cost a lot of people a lot of effort and a lot of money, and the dream didn't come true. You know, they don't all come true. You don't get to do them all. Charmaine and I are driving down the highway and I'm staring out the window forlornly at the universe, and she's driving, and finally she turns over to me and she says, James, what are you thinking about? Knowing I was lost in space on something. And I said, so I told her. She said, my God, what is that gonna cost? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, I'm not real sure, but it's gonna cost at least a couple of hundred thousand dollars and then it was dead silence and we drove on for another few miles and finally I said you know I don't think I'll do that <laughs> and we drove another few miles and she said well good <laughs> since we're saving all of that money let's go to dinner <laughs> Sometimes you get deeper into them than that. There actually is some expense at it. Uh, God, this is called me and rough God. I'm gonna give you a, the 60 second version of a certain history. I grew up in the Baptist church in East Texas. I had drank a lot of Kool-Aid by the time I was a senior in high school. I was in the choir. Uh, I, was, I was part of the activity. Um, I reached a point where I couldn't believe it anymore. But I was not willing to throw out what I would call a living concept of God. I wasn't ready to abandon that part. I, I was ready to abandon that the snake 
you know, caused Eve all that trouble. I mean, I know, and uh, now nah, I'm not going for that one. You know, uh, I was ready to abandon the fact that Eve was pulled out of the rib of Adam. You know, oh, no, I'm not going for that one. Joseph Campbell annihilated a whole bunch of that stuff. Um, and, but down in my heart, I needed something. I needed something. I, I didn't, I, I couldn't just walk away. Half of my friends are devout atheists. Okay, the key word there is not atheist, it's devout. They're devout to being something. Their something is nothing. They're devout to nothing. I thought, man, I'm gonna be devout to something. You know, I gotta, I gotta stick something in there. So my reality checks on it was, if there is to be a belief system encompassing the word God, for me personally, I'm not inflicting this on anybody, but for me personally, I had to reconcile myself with the fact that over 200 million people were killed in the 20th century at the hands of other people. People kill people. That's who kills people, is other people. Lions and tigers and bears, they got, they got a pretty low, <laughs> They got a pretty low record on there. Oh, there's three people killed in America in the last 10 years by bears. There were three people killed in the last three minutes by other people. Um, how do I reconcile that? You know, um, I'm, my conclusion is that uh, I'm sort of of the Van Morrison, Van, Van Morrison school of thought. You know, the rough God goes riding. And when the rough God rides, man, you better get out of the way because there's some devastation coming. And I'm not talking about hurricanes and floods and lightning strikes and tornadoes. And we, we can have a real understanding of those things. Those things are, are kind of explainable in a bizarre way. We can understand them. I don't know that we can understand why somebody would kill six million of a, one group of people and 12 million of another group of people and 36 million Russians died and on and on and on. I, I mean, man, I mean, that's some tough stuff, you know, and where do I slot that in my world, in my art? Is it even applicable? I'm not a blue bonnet painter, you know, uh, and I'm not saying that with any kind of slightness or derogatoriness or any other way. I think that we literally are born of an era. We're born of a time. We're born of a place. We're born in this place everywhere. Our place is everywhere. Um, I want to fit within the context of not just East Texas and not just Texas. You know, first of all, I'm way closer to you know, Benjamin Franklin, for God's sakes, than I am to a lot of these guys in the, quote, high art world. You know, I, I have no connection with them whatsoever. Um, I never understood. You know, I, I was on a show at the Whitney with Donald Judd and Jasper Johns, two of the, quote, big names in the, in the art world. You know, oh my God, Donald Judd and Jasper Johns. And I got to be in a show with them, same room, us three. And I thought, man, that's it, I've made it. I'm here, I've arrived. You know, this is, this is it's not gonna get any better than this. Man, they got critical acclaim that like you couldn't believe and I wasn't even mentioned. I mean, New York could care less about two big old carved wooden figures from East Texas. You know, that didn't figure into their world. Uh, and I, quite literally, I thought, I, I got more and more and more comfortable going back into East Texas, going back into the woods, going back to where I was loved and liked and had a, a literal high degree of... Uh, of, of unencumbered possibilities. And sculptures like this show that, you know, it's, I am 
the red oak blade. That's me. That's what I am. I'm a big red oak blade right out of the center of a big red oak tree. Um, but I'm also part of the heated steel, the beat and the bang and the, the, the literally the forged, um, the forged steel that helped make all of that 20th century nightmare stuff. Um, I'm a male. I grew up in a patriarchal world where the male shook his tea glass and some female poured some more tea into it. You know, uh, that was real. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't just a fake world, that was real. Go ahead. That one's here at the Umlauf. It's, that's again, that's looking out of our kitchen window. You can see that over at the Umlauf. Go ahead. This is at a botanical garden in Denver. I had seven pieces along Park Avenue. They, they went from the front, of, front door of the Waldorf Astoria up to 57th Street. And I was told that, and I'm gonna make this up because I don't remember the exact, but like <laughs> two or three, two or three hundred thousand people a day walked up and down that street. And so there'll be, they calculated it out. They, oh, you know, there's gonna be three million people see your art. Well, not really, because at least two and a half million of those people were walking with their heads down. <laughs> they had no clue what was out there. Uh, a writer, I don't remember what paper, but for some, some paper in New York wrote about them, and he, he said they're wild and wonderful yard art. Yard art. Uh, okay. Yeah, really? So's your mother. <laughs> you gotta just keep going. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. That's a big... Um, nightshade and a uh, the trunk of a cedar tree from Utah. The cedar tree trunk has been carved on but l very little. You, you, you can't make it something it's not but you can accent it. The nightshade, the morning glory, the bloom Boy, that's a powerful, powerful image. When I was a little boy, my mother put strings up on the east side of the house and she planted blue morning glories along and the whole east side of our little house was covered with blue morning glories every morning. Go ahead. This is called Seattle Speaks. This is the sculpture that was made from hearing the elk traverse the mountain in the pre-dawn hours and make the noise. Um, you know, in the storeroom saga, I got a group of uh, Aspen ex-CEOs in Aspen that got more money than you can haul in a freight train. You know, they're all very successful business guys. And <clears throat> I got four of them together and they come down to the studio and we're all sitting around talking and <clears throat> I'm asking them, I'm telling them, A, that I've, my studio is full, it's impacted. You can't, we can virtually not even walk. It's so full of art. And I was talking about storage 
And one of them said, Searles, you don't have a storage problem. You got a sales problem. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Go ahead. The question is, is who's going to buy something that's 18 foot tall and weighs 800 pounds and will just barely go in your house? I mean, how many, how many indoor spaces are there available to do that with? And the strata gets narrowed. But I operate under a premise, and my premise is this. It doesn't make any difference how big or little I make something. It doesn't make any difference how heavy it is. The reality is there's only one person on the planet that's going to buy it. Only one. My marketing strategy is to one, some one unknown person out there in the world. That's hard to market to, you know. <laughs> I, this piece is sitting in our yard. You know, it's huge. It's an incredibly important piece. And... When we're broke and sitting around the kitchen table saying, oh my God, where'd our money go? Well, that's where it went. <laughs> go ahead. This is in Houston. This one actually had a payday. This is on, the, uh, this is in, on Kirby near Westheimer, across the street from the world's biggest Tootsies. <laughs> go ahead. I put a few drawings. Uh, she sees between the totals. All of these drawings are very poetically specific. They're, they're, they're about a thing, a certain psychological thing. Um, her eyes are covered with a prism where light is fractured through, knowledge is fractured through the prism. Go ahead. I drew this with my eyes shut. I drew it with my eyes shut. I drew the figure. I did not draw the prisms with my eyes shut. I opened my eyes to draw those straight line components. The rest of it I drew I drew like this, pushing on the piece of paper. Go ahead. This is called string tie, string tie theory. Go ahead. This is a new piece. I just finished it in the past year. Well, year and a year and a few months, I guess. Go ahead. I made this specifically for a certain collector. <clears throat> and when we set it up for the certain collector to show it to his wife, she didn't like it. So I had to pack it up and take it home. <laughs> so it's now in our collection. <laughs> it's big. It's like five foot by ten. Go ahead. This is over at the Umlauf. Go ahead. This is new as well. Go ahead. This is the last wooden sculpture I made, and it's called Cockfighting. Um, man. That's part of Texas, you know. That's just part of Texas, that whole... <clears throat> I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on the psychological nature of a cockfight. <laughs> you, you could get buried in that one. Uh, it's illegal, but the sheriff is there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's 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 a real it's a real machoistic male phenomenon. A lot of phenomenons are real machoistic 
things. That's part of what we do. Um, go ahead. Different view. Go ahead. That's the head, a blade. The others are spurs, gaffs, um, thorns. Go ahead. Okay, now I, I'm going to close with uh, three or four drawings. And this is a drawing that I did. The left side of the drawing is done with my left hand. The right side of the drawing is done with my right hand. And I, I did not close my eyes, by the way. I drew this with my eyes open. Um, <clears throat> but I wanted it to be and represent. It's about conversing. Um, I've, I've asked myself before, how do you have a conversation with a lake? How do you have a conversation with a tree? How do you converse with the wind? You know, I mean, if you want to speak to nature, if you're the only one speaking, then there wasn't a conversation. You have to listen. So it, whatever it is, will speak back to you. So this is two sides of a conversation. Um, go ahead. I think, I, I can't read the writing on it, but I think this is called the river here. Deep. River deep. Deep. Steep. S-T-E-E-P. S-T-E-E-P. What does that spell? S-T-E-E-P. <laughs> <laughs> -E -E that spells deep. <laughs> okay. Um, I grew up in the meander of the rivers. I mean, water doesn't just flow in a big, long, straight line, except in Southern California. Uh, the rest of the, the rest of the place, it'll flow, it'll get ahead of itself, and it'll make a curve, and it'll flow and get ahead of itself, and that's why there's bows. That's what causes an oxbow in a big river, is that flow of the water that curves around itself. So this is, this is the confluence of a river. I used to, I wrote about one time about the uh, little, the eddies, the eddies in the mainstream. And I, that came from thinking that the mainstream at one time was Rome or Venice, and then it moved to London or Paris, and then it moved from, from Paris and London, it moved to New York in the late 40s and 50s, and the time it came across the Atlantic, for God's sakes, it had made some abrupt changes. That's where that whole new abstract expressionist world came from. You know, the start anew, go from, go from the blank canvas into just pure chaos and then bring it back into order. You know, uh, that's what this is and very cross-like, very face-like, very shield-like, um, and hopefully meaningful. Uh, all right, go ahead. What's this called? In Silent Night. <laughs> In Silent Night. Well, nights are not silent. If you go outside and standing there in the dark, you're going to hear something. You, if it's nothing else, you'll hear, you'll hear a dog in the distance. You know, in East Texas, we inevitably could hear a train whistle from somewhere. It'd be miles off, but you could hear it. I'm sure the same thing's true in West Texas. If you get a motel out in Del Hart, you're in big trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I look at it like the trees can speak. The trees have a face. The trees have a personality. 
Um, go ahead. I drew, uh, this is one of those left and right hand drawings. This is a, a rabbi and a priest. Good luck. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, now the last couple, and then I'm through. The last couple are about um, about a year and a half ago. I entered into a serious, in-depth conversation to do a to be commissioned a sculpture for the new. Holocaust and Human Rights Museum in Dallas, Texas. And I was indeed commissioned to do that sculpture. Uh, it's going in what I referred to as the memory garden. It's an outdoor garden area. And it was stated to me that this was a place of contemplation. So I dubbed it memory, the memory garden. In, in the memory garden, as I started to recall and recollect, the day I was born, April 19th, 1943, when you walk into the Holocaust Museum in Dallas, Texas, they have a whole room devoted to April 19th, 1943 the day I was born, there were people being loaded into cattle cars and hauled off. You know, I mean, quite literally, one of the highest cultures on the planet was fully imploding. It had reached a point of total implosion. I don't know if Roger will remember this, but I wrote a poem when I was at SMU back in the uh, early 70s about inhaling a mountain, about going inside of a mountain and inhaling the mountain with such force that you sucked the whole entire mountain into your being. And then you exhaled with such force that the mountain then just simply spewed out across the horizon. It is like making yourself Mount St. Helens. I, I wanted to make in my um, thought pattern, I wanted to put into my thought pattern that 20th century world. Um, the quote, nasty part of humanity. And basically it has to do with steel, guns, heavy steel decks, battleships, tanks, iron fortresses, you know. Well, I was a baby. I was a little, I was a little baby. During that same year, an artist from Houston, Texas named Alice Kahana. Alice Kahana was in a concentration camp when she was 12 years old. And she gathered 23 girls that was in her barracks, whatever you call the room they were in. And the only object in the room was a broom that had straw, a straw broom she broke off 23 straws and gave each girl a straw and put them, aligned them in a circle and had them move slowly uh, around the circle. In essence, dancing in a circle of life in Auschwitz. I, I thought to myself, are you kidding me? I've heard artists complain about no studios, no paper, no pencils, no this, no that. I mean, I mean, give me a break. You can be in Auschwitz and you can be creative enough 
to muster the force to do something of that psychological significance. Alice told me that the guard, the jailer, gave her a can of sardines, not sardines, I'm sorry, a can of snails. She got a, he, he gave her a can of snails, a little can of snails as a reward. So even at that base level, that, that deep, depressed level of existence, that moment, she was handed a plaque, a can of snails. And I thought, man, I'm never going to complain about where I work or the fact that I don't have a this or that or the other. I got it made, you know? I mean, I am really doing good. All of the background of the next few pieces I'm going to show you comes from a photograph of my work table. I have a five foot by 10 foot by one inch thick steel table. I've had it for 40 years. I've welded onto the table, I've beat on the table, I've grinded on the table, I've torched on the table, I've heated up things to red hot and mashed it on the table. The table carries all of the battle scars of 40 years of art making. I took detailed photographs and then blew them up and drew on it. So what you're looking at there, the background is a detail enlargement of a segment of my steel work table. And then I drew images onto it. Um, go ahead. Now I think there's just a couple of more. This is kind of ending up where I started off in the talk about uh, forever, swimming in forever. Um, it's like a never ending line, a line that just continues and continues and curves and rounds and continues and continues and continues into perpetuity. If there is indeed a reality to forever. Um, I, I think we can, in one sense, conceive that there is a forever. In another sense, we can't. It's too big a grasp. It's too far to reach. But in another way, mathematically and scientifically, forever may not even exist because there will be a, a whole new beginning and end. It's like turtles stacked back to back for as far as the eye can see. Go ahead. I love the idea of conjuring out of, conjuring out of the dirt, conjuring out of the, the floor, the wall, the ceiling, the sky, the night, the ocean, the mud hole. And that's what this is. This is part of a bizarre kind of night jungle that I am deeming to be that in reality is a photograph of my work table. It's something that simple. I turned a 3,000 pound table up, got up close with a big old giant camera, took 200 meg pictures and then enhanced them up to 1,000 and had them printed down in Wimberley, Texas by a person who does that, that's what they do, is they print those things. I got them all back and drew on them, sent them to Dallas, had them framed, had the frames sent from Dallas to Austin. They're all over at Bale Creek Islands right now, this very minute. So if you all rushed out of here and went over to Bales, <laughs> you could go see them. And I think this may be the last one. No, one more, maybe two more, I don't know. Uh, they're extraordinarily simple. They're very clean. 
They're very simple. They're very directed. Um, and it's a change. It's a change for me because I use white paper with a black line. Here I use loaded, I loaded up the, the ground. I loaded up the paper and drew on it with white. Okay, one more. This is a picture of one wall in my studio where I cleaned all the rest out so I could do something, but you multiply that by a hundred now and that's how full it is. So maybe this is the last slide, and if it is, then I, then I do we have time for a few minutes of questions? Yes. Yes. If you have any questions, this is your shot. <laughs> <laughs> Um. <laughs> you go first. Go ahead. There were a series in there where they were the great shadows on the wall. Do you consider the, what kind of shadows those make when you make the piece or not? Oh man, I don't even necessarily have to. It's like the shadow becomes inherent. It it. Uh, you remember the term, a clean, well-lit space? We've all heard that. In the 70s, that was the mode for galleries. They wanted a clean, white, well-lit space. One of the best kind of uh, little hissy type arguments I've had with an art dealer was in LA where they didn't want any shadows. They wanted to wash the shadows from the wall. And I said, but I want the shadows. No, no, we can't have the shadows. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I love the shadows. The shadows really become an integral part. And I tell you what, man, every time I've done a show of any consequence, the shadows were, the shadows were right there and very, very important. Any other, yes? Who else in your family has the gift of your ability? My wife, she's a, she, I'm not just saying that, that's not just a, that's not, I mean, if she likes to say, I'm not trying to butter her up. <laughs> <laughs> well, a little. <laughs> no, my daughter is a poet uh, poets are weird. <laughs> I mean, poets always have a hard time coming back. They can go. They can drift into the universe. But sometimes their return is a pretty rocky. Um, I don't know. I think it was well stated this morning that your children don't necessarily carry carry your love, you know, that's, that's not necessarily part of their deal. Charmaine and I have designated pieces to give to our kids, and it'd be like this big, and they would say, oh, I don't have any place to put it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Yeah, I, I'm confident you're going to be remembered for generations. I wonder if you might put into a few sentences that which you hope you will be remembered for. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That's a good question because I am of an age where I am giving, I'm actually giving some thought to legacy. I am. I mean, I would be remiss if I told you I wasn't. Um, a couple of years ago, I had the honor of making a sculpture for the country of Singapore to commemorate their 50th, the 50th anniversary of a country. And it went into their national garden. And I thought, boy, that's the biggest thing since rolled oats. You know, I was, I was, I was very happy about that. I mean, literally. Getting the commission to do the sculpture for the garden at the Holocaust and Human Rights Museum has now moved up to the 
moved up to the, I guess the apex of, of what I would call an accomplishment. You know, I don't know. I, um, I get to live where I want. I get to live with the person I want. I get to do what I want. I have a free life. Money's a struggle sometimes, but I don't really count that, you know? So I don't know. I, I, I guess I want to be remembered for just being a creative person. And uh, I, I like the idea of generosity. I would like to be remembered as a generous person. Uh, I, I have always tried to be generous. I, I have found that me saying yes to people and being generous with them has brought me may, way more rewards than chopping off tentacles. Uh, I loved my students. You know, I always tried to elevate them. Charles Pebworth was my teacher and he, he elevated me. So I like that idea of elevation. So I don't know. I, um, I, I, I have a book that's called Epitaphs. <laughs> There's some really funny things on people's headstones, you know. I don't know. I don't know that I could answer the question directly, although I appreciate you asking that. Any other questions? How many kids do you have? I have seven daughters. Seven? Yes, yeah, seven daughters. Yes, sir? Yeah, I was wondering, James, uh, in your communication, uh, were you using the right and left hand thing? Were you doing those at the same time? Yeah. Was well, the same time? Yeah. And are you napping the right or left hand? No, I'm, I'm right-handed. Um, my brother was totally ambidextrous in as much as he could throw a ball with either hand, he could, he could catch with either hand, and he could bat left-handed or right-handed. He could use an ax with either hand. I never did, really. I always, I'm, I'm right-handed. So drawing left-handed... Uh, it, I don't think it necessarily came natural, but I, I think, to tell you the truth, that people get extraordinarily good at doing what they do if they practice it, you know, and once, once you start, then all of a sudden it gets easier and easier and easier. Yes? Personal question, not related to art, really. But uh, since you, you live in a remote place, do you, Charmaine, uh, have a garden? Do you grow some of your own uh, vegetables? We have a great garden down at Whole Foods. <laughs> 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 hey, one of my absolute joys is going out to dinner. <laughs> you could tell. Uh, we have had a garden, but we, we don't in Colorado. The gardens in Colorado are a little tough. They're a little, they're, I mean, at, a, at, a, at you know, seven, 8,000 feet, gardens are a little tough. Yes, sir? You mentioned earlier that you had tons of ideas, 10 years of ideas. And I also noticed that in your sculpture, you used an amazing variety of woods, a lot from East Texas, both art and I know. When you approach a new piece, are you more likely to walk in the studio and look at the wood you've got and, and you start by looking at what you have there? Or does it start with the ideas? And from the ideas, then you go to the wood top. It does both. Uh, it can go either way. I use the analogy that you could get into, excuse me, you can get into the house by simply walking formally right through the front door. You could come into the house through the back door you could crawl in through the bathroom window. It doesn't make any difference. If you're in, you're in. If the concept is solidified, it can be brought directly from the wood itself. The wood can say, here's what you need to make out of me. Or I can say, here's what I want to make. Now I need to go find something to do it with. I, I, I work both ways. Charmaine, when we lived in Splendora, had uh, peacocks and turkeys and chickens and Oh man, we had uh, 
chicken snakes that was you wouldn't believe. I mean, like six, seven, eight feet long. And uh, we had a snake get into the uh, eggs. I think it's peacock eggs because it had a big lump in the snake. So you'd be here's the snake and here's the big lump where the egg is, and then here's the snake and here's another big lump. So you know it's like <laughs> what you know. So I looked, I looked for years to find a limb with a lump, so I could make a snake with a lump in it. I never found one. I mean, I'm still looking, and that was 35 years ago. <laughs> but conceptually speaking, I don't want to walk into my studio and then say, oh man, I hope something good happens today. I want to walk into my studio and say, I'm going to make something good happen today. And I'll tell you, I was on a panel once with a museum curator and two other artists, and the nature of the panel was doubt. That was the theme, the subject. So the curator intellectually asked artist A when they had periods of doubt, and the artist would go through and say, oh, well, once I blah, 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 you know, I was in a dark place with doubt, and next artist, oh, I doubted when the blah, 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 and they got to me, and I said, well, I don't doubt. So you got the wrong guy on the panel. <laughs> Does that mean that you come upon something serendipitously and you don't pursue it? No, it means I do pursue it. Uh, I will pursue anything anywhere under any circumstances that I can possibly get it. Uh, I mean, I've stopped on the side of the road and walked up into people's yard and looked in their wood pile and said, oh, look at that, you know. Uh, the problem is, is that you can't you can't physically, you, you, you can't do all those things. Are we out of time, Katie? No, nope, you can do these two last two. Two time. more, okay. Yes, sir? Is there one piece that you're most proud of? Or one or, so which is your favorite piece that you've ever done? Well, David, that's, uh, well, it's a real tough question. That's like, with seven daughters and they're all different, and which one am I the proudest of? I, I mean, man, I could get in big trouble. <laughs> well, the, one of the pieces that I like, and, and keep in mind, I love everything I do. I mean, I, I really do. I mean, I like, and when I finish one, I go, oh man, look at that, you know, that's great. Um, but there's one over at the Umlauf that doesn't belong to me. It's, it's, it's called The Death of St. Sebastian. And it's a real powerful, powerful piece. That's, uh, and I, you know, I, 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 I listen. I like everything at the Umlauf. I like everything I made over there. But, but that one, I don't know that I'd say it's my favorite. But if I had to pick one to run away with, you know, and yeah. and save from a fire, yeah. that would be it. Yes. I have a question about um, the critics. So <laughs> the critics seem to, whatever their critique is of your work comes from where they are rather than from where you are. So do you correct them? No, 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 no. No, no, I would never correct them. I don't write them a nasty letter. I don't send them a tacky note. I don't attack them on an elevator, you know. <laughs> Hey, I have a friend who does. <laughs> My friend John, on Ele John Alexander got on an elevator with Roberta Smith, from, who writes for the New York Times. And man, how much the time it was, the elevator got to the, down to where it was going, she was crying, you know? I mean, he just let her have it. I, I, no, I, I just say thank you, thank you very much. Appreciate the effort. If I can ever do anything for you, let me know. It, it's it's got no bearing on what I do, you know. So, you know, I might be sitting at home with Charmaine, grumbling about some critic somewhere, but I don't do it in public, you know. <laughs>
I don't, I don't go out and make an issue uh, out of it. They, how could it not be from where they come from? Of course it's from where they come from. You know, it's that guy that wrote for the Soho News, he, he lived down there, in, you know, in uh, what do you call that square, Washington Square area. You know, that was his, his domain. I mean, n n nightlife and nightmares, that's part of his deal. You know, I lived, I lived in, in, in rural East Texas. I lived in the lap of nature. I mean, I, I had a great life. I mean, how could his life and my life possibly line up? He liked, he loved the art. He actually said it was a great piece of art. He wrote about it like it was a, an incredibly important piece of art, but at the heart of it, he just missed. <laughs> Thank you, people. I love you.